Please remain standing for the reading of God's word out of thankfulness to God for giving us his word. At the conclusion of the reading, I'll invite you to say, uh, thanks be to God after I say, this is the word of the Lord. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheatil, and Sheatil the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Ebiud, and Ebiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Elizor, and Elizor the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob. I'm Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. Um, well, at the beginning, let's give Mr. Andrew Lovett a round of applause for owning those names. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Advent at the King's Church. Anyone feeling Christmassy yet? All right. Well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Rob Lurcy, and today I have the honor of kicking off Advent with you guys. Um, but Advent, not with Jesus in a manger just yet, Jesus in a genealogy. So... Um, Somehow or another, every time I have the opportunity to preach, I get texts like this, so this is fantastic, a list of names, I like to thank the elders for entrusting me with this, and here we go. So, <clears throat> let's just be honest, let's, let's just, this is safe space, um, in your Bible readings, I skip this, oftentimes, when I come to this text. I'll look at it and be like, mm hmm, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, yep, mm hmm. Uh, kind of know who those people are. I can't even pronounce that, that block of names. Okay, Jesus, let's get, let's, let's get this baby born, right? Um, and I think we do a disservice, one, to the scriptures when we do that, but two, we're kind of shortchanging what's intended, God is intending for us, the audience of these scriptures. So if I could make a comparison, stay with me to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Easy, I know. But hey, I'm giving a list of names. I'm going to use superheroes if I can. So, um, if you think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's one big story in the midst of all these other stories that are going on. And say you were to watch 
Avengers Endgame. If you were to just watch that without watching the other stories, you'd be kind of lost. You would be able to understand, okay, there's this purple dude who's trying to get these six colorful stones called Infinity Stones, put him in a really cool glove and snap his fingers, wiping out half of the population of the entire universe. Okay. Random people show up through different portals, hammers are thrown, it's just madness. However, the storyteller, the author, is assuming that you know these little individual stories and how they piece together in this bigger story. So these micro stories of Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Captain Marvel, all these people have a place in this larger macro story. So those were my superhero comparisons end. Um, so you can breathe the sigh of relief if that's not your jam. However, one more thing about those stories. Now, stories of superheroes, stories of fiction, they're great. They inspire us, we read them, and we want to be better people. But they exist in a world that's not real. They may have elements. It may say New York City on there, but there's not aliens actually invading Stark Tower. That doesn't exist. There's not a magical hammer that you can lift and get the strength of Thor, no matter how big my beard might be. I'm trying. These stories are written to motivate, to inspire something. They give good advice. Don't be like a giant purple guy who wants to wipe out half of the population. Don't be like these bad people. Be like these heroes. Work hard enough, and you can save the day. Work hard enough, and you can save those people. Work hard enough, and you can work yourself out of your current state and get a cool little emblem on your chest and movies named after you and copyright to your own merch. The story of the Bible is not that. The story of the Bible is real. The story of the Bible tells us that we are not the main character. It reveals that we are the helpless person in need of rescue. It puts us in the background in the supporting cast while putting God at the beginning. No, the story of the Bible is not good advice. The story of the Bible is a proclamation of good news. That's what the angels proclaim to the shepherds in the fields. Behold, I bring you tidings of good news that will be for all of the people. And so that's why I want to kind of separate, because I think we like to, in the entertainment-driven culture, we like to think about the Bible's story in light of fictional stories, rather than the other way around. The way we read the Bible and understand the real world that the Bible is prescribing and describing helps us rightly understand these fictional stories and appreciate them a bit more. So, let's pause, let's pray, and ask the Lord to do a work today. Heavenly Father, another Sunday you have given us, another week beginning, a chance to see your beauty through your scriptures. So God, I pray that you speak today. I pray that your Holy Spirit uses a weak vessel like myself to proclaim the excellencies of your Son, Jesus, and your love to us, a wayward people. God, speak through this text, speak through me, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here's my main idea. I've already alluded to it, but let's just... For you note takers, let's just give a one sentence understanding here. So the story of Advent begins with a genealogy to show that this is good news and not good advice. The story of Advent begins with a genealogy to show that this is good news and not good advice. Now how we're going to be breaking down the text, we're going to divide it into three sections. We're going to first, before we get to the text, we're going to understand a setting. Then we're going to look at the text and understand its characters, which are broken up into three groups of 14. And then we're going to look at the continuing story. So that's our task today. That's the effort that we're looking at. So let me tell you a little bit about the author and the audience of this section here. So Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, a Jewish audience who knows its history. It knows from where they came, what their condition is now, and have some things that were told and prophesied in Scripture to be looking for, for this long-awaited Messiah who is coming to rescue them. 
So with that backdrop, in order for good news to be proclaimed to someone, there is a state of bad news that preceded this. So let's give the setting here. In the beginning, Matthew is not the beginning of our story. Matthew is a continuation, a uh, realignment of sorts to where we're properly placing ourselves as a supporting cast and God is the beginning, the author, the main character. So we need to revert back into the beginning of the story. And I talk about micro, macro. Another way to talk about the big story of scripture is what we who spend lots of money on seminary degrees like to use because I need to show that my money was worth it. So meta narrative of scripture, okay? Let's define it. How I define the meta narrative of scripture is like this, that God the Father is redeeming a people through God the Son uniting them together by God the Holy Spirit for his glory and our good. One more time. The meta narrative of scripture, big story. God the Father is redeeming a people through God the Son, uniting them together through God the Holy Spirit for his glory and our good. Notice, God is at the beginning and the middle of that. The ending is still God, but it's us. What is happening is for our good. Everything works and acts because God was in the beginning of it all. You see, as I pointed out, Matthew is a continuation of the story. The story began in Genesis. In the beginning, God created. He was before all things. He speaks the universe into existence through his word. The New Testament authors will pick up on this theme. Paul in Colossians would say that through Jesus... Everything that was made came into being. Jesus, as this agent of creation, the, the disciple John in his gospel will say that Jesus is the word, almost as if God's speaking word, his audible word, is his son in which things are coming into being, that he's the one who creates it all. And then we see God the Spirit hovering over the waters, intricately all connected in this creating process. So God's plan is to fill a world with worshipers. He is worthy of worship. He, worship is due to him. And so he creates Adam and Eve. He breathes life into Adam's nostrils, the breath of life, and animates the, the man and tells them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the world with worshipers. And so places them in a garden amongst all of the trees with fruit and all kinds of vegetation, things that they can eat, but gives them one restriction. Don't eat from that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here's God, creator of all, the author of all, the person in the limelight, our hero, giving them instructions. And so as their creation, they submit to that. However, just like in pretty much all stories, there's an antagonist, one who works against the plans of our hero. He enters into this garden through the serpent. This is Satan, father of lies. He goes and he deceives Adam and Eve, puts doubt into their mind of the goodness, and then through their own pride, thinking, you know what? God started this thing. He probably needs my help. So I know he told me that this tree was off limits. He said it's not good, but it is pleasing to the eye. They're determining for themselves, I will declare this tree good, though God has declared it not good. They take and eat. And what's interesting is the author of Genesis talks about when God created Adam and Eve, they were naked and unashamed. This seems awkward to us, but this is a completion of the shalom of the garden, this peace that is unencumbered by anything. No shame, everything working exactly how God created it. Sin enters in, fractures start. Ripple effects go out. The immediate consequence that Adam and Eve come about is their eyes are open and they see that they're naked, so they hide. What God has joined together, they are now putting barricades in place. We need distance. So they sew fig leaves together and make coverings for themselves. And then they hear the voice of God walking in the garden, and they think, oh no, we got to hide. For those of us with kids, we know that this is a common practice amongst our children who in shame after they break a rule or realize that what they're doing gets them in trouble, they go and they hide rather than run to the one who shows love. So they go and hide and God says, hey, guess what? I'm all-knowing. You can't hide from me. He calls them out, draws them in there. 
but sin has consequences. And so God has to exile them for their good. Because there's also a tree in the garden, which is the tree of life. And God tells us that he does not want Adam and Eve to eat from that tree and live forever in that state. So God promises there will be a rescuer who will come from the woman who will undo all of this work so that you can be restored in right relationship with God and in the end eat from that tree of life and live forever with him. And so the rest of the story of the Old Testament is us as the reader looking for this promised Messiah, this Christ, this anointed one from Eve's line, and we are left time and time again wanting and wanting and wanting. However, there's hope in the midst of this. Verse 1 talks about, uh, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Already, Matthew's like, hey, remember David and Abraham. Covenants, God's promise, one of Abraham, who was a pagan guy living his life. God calls him out through faith. Abraham obeys, and God promises him to make his name great, promises a people, to build a people, promises that to give them a land of inheritance, and then that through him all the nations of the world will be blessed. And then we also see 1,200 years later that there is a shepherd king from the tribe of Judah, from Bethlehem, who's anointed unexpectedly by the surrounding people, that God says, this is my king. He will have a descendant of his will be on the throne forever. So this first section, as we have gone from the background to now into the text in these groups of 14s, this first section we can uh, call the known, broken them up into the known, the familiar, and the obscure. And this also is telling a story. So here is basically the highlight of God's people, the high point. This is the pinnacle. They have promises. We know that through Abraham, a nation of Israel is there. God gives them a land. He has a king. And that's what this story is telling us. So if genealogies in this setting, in this context, act as resumes for a Messiah coming, these are the people you want. At least at the beginning. We see Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, okay. We see Judah, but then we get to three specific names. Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Now, to a Jewish audience, these names would be quite scandalous. These three women were not from the tribe of any of the tribes of Israel. They're from pagan peoples with Scandalous backgrounds. Rahab, her title is prostitute. Through different types of sin, we know uh, through Tamar, her story is in Genesis 38. I just invite you just to go read that. I don't have time for it, but just to say, it's a messed up story. <laughs> and then Ruth, a foreigner whose people came about as a result of sexual sin from Lot, who is Abraham's nephew and one of his daughters. What is, what is God doing here? Why is he including these types of people in this genealogy? Well, Matthew, as a master storyteller, is building a case that we'll get to. So just put a pen in that. You should be looking and anticipating. So these are the known people, even the names that look like they shouldn't be in there. Then we move to this next section. These would be the familiar, verses 6b through 11. Here, we kind of get into this downward spiral in our macro story. Downward spiral of the kingdom. So God has created a people through Abraham. They have land. Uh, they need a king. David is king. He's actually the second king. Saul comes first. And so David, this shepherd boy that no one expected, comes and he's sitting on the throne. God is just blessing him. He's ruling and reigning and he's prospering wherever he goes, given the title a man after God's own heart. But there's an introduction of another woman in this, um, in this lineage. 
And just another parenthetical statement here. Um, including women in the timeline may be kind of lost on us in our 21st century minds, but back in these times, women, they didn't have rights. They didn't have prestige. Their names didn't mean as much as the men or the patriarchs at this point. So already, including women in here is doing a weird thing to the audience. So I don't want us to lose that. And especially these specific women that Matthew is including. So here, the second part of verse 6, we see that David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So this gets us to 2 Samuel. David has come, he's conquered, he's ruling lands, he's bringing about peace of Israel through the sword, and now David's just in the palace, living his best life. He's thinking, man, God's blessed me so much, but springtime's coming. Springtime, the Bible tells us, at least in that time, was a time when kings go to war. So the army of Israel, they're out fighting battles, but where is David? He's in his palace, not where he should be. And so David, walking around, spies a woman. She's bathing. He looks upon her, says, she cute? Sends his errand boy, hey, find out who that girl is. Goes, comes back, and says, is this not Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah? Now, Uriah, the Bible also tells us, is one of David's mighty men, a man of valor, one of this close group of people to David who fought by his side for years. So naturally, David comes to his senses, and he's like, dang, man, of course, this is, this is my homie's wife. I can't, I, you know what, I have a few wives already, God's blessed me a lot, I should be at battle, I'm just going to go and leave. Nope. Instead, David sees an opportunity. With a cavalier attitude and pride, he declares good for him what God has said was not good. He sends his people to go get Bathsheba, to bring her to himself. He commits adultery and then sends her away, casts her aside once he gets what he wants from that relationship. Lo and behold, Bathsheba becomes pregnant informs the king and says, here it is. So David begins to sow his own fig leaves through a series of trying to cover up his mistake. It results in the death of Uriah, one of his friends, one of his mighty men who is fighting in the place that David should be fighting in. So David has him killed in battle. Now, we have a widow. Oh, here comes our hero, David. I'll just marry her. Boom, everything's good. But yet, God speaks through his prophets. He says, I'm all-knowing. You cannot hide this, no matter the means that you go through, the hoops you jump through to try to conceal this. I know. And as a result of your sin, David, there will be strife that will continue on through your family. Foreigners will come. They will take your wives. The sword shall never leave your house. And that's how we see this progression play out. However, through that relationship, who started off with means of abuse and cover-ups and scandalous activities, God brings about Solomon, the next king. And then through him, we start to see the ripple effects of sin play out. More and more people are starting to vie for the throne. Descendants of David are like, no, this is my throne, this is my throne. And so they start to fight with one another. Blood is shed, the kingdom divides into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And this section of names follows the kings of the southern tribe of Judah. Which leads us to further ripple effects of a series of people doing what's right in their own eyes. Kings that do not follow, do not walk in the ways of their father David, who... There, there are cycles of good kings and bad kings, but ultimately sin's ripple effects have gone out so far that God hands the people over to pagan nations who come and conquer their land and leads God's people to the deportation into Babylon. Exile. That's where verse 11 ends us. So now we move to the next section, the obscure, the names that 
maybe even to the audience, they may not know formally, they may be familiar with, but to us, it's quite lost on who we are. The Bible doesn't really give us who these people are. But there's an interesting way that Matthew uses the names to connect to this macro story, this meta narrative of Scripture. So, right now, we should be thinking <clears throat> God has promised Abraham a nation, a land, people being blessed through them, and David a throne, that a descendant from him will continue to reign. But the reality of where they find themselves at this point in the story, we find this in First and Second Chronicles, is the people are scattered, hopeless. They are their land taken, not really an opportunity to bless others because they can't act in their own accord. And there's no more throne for a descendant for David to sit on. Is God faithful? Has sin won? Has the antagonist claimed victory. We get glimmers of hope all throughout this period, this e period of exile through the prophets, through the major and minor prophets, and this a continuous message of hope given. Here's your condition. God knows this. Wait, I will send a rescuer. That promise that was made in the beginning, the current state you find yourself in as a result of sin, I will do away with that. Trust me. Be patient and wait. And so what's interesting here is through Zerubbabel, who kind of starts this section, uh, and his leadership along with Ezra and Nehemiah kind of show at the end of Second Chronicles this picture of hope along with the prophet Jeremiah. So let's, it'll be on the screens, but Second Chronicles 36, 22 and 23, listen. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord came by the mouth of Jeremiah so that it might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build the house, build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. This is absolutely astounding. Throughout Israel's history, we see kings and people who are trying to fly above their station, trying to share and the, the light, trying to grab the spotlight from God so that they can co-write this story together. It's like, ah, you're taking too much time. Let me, let me help you with this. And so God exiles them in an act of mercy. <laughs> and then he uses a pagan king who does not honor God to accomplish his purposes, to begin this return from exile. And so we see through Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, the Old Testament ends after this period of, of these people, Ezra and Nehemiah, and then we'll get to there. Let me, let me slow down. Um, we always here at the King Church, we like to commend um, videos and teachings that the Bible Project puts together. And the Bible Project, they have a series of videos, one throughout each book of the Bible, to show how these micro stories fit into the macro story, the meta narrative. But then also they take on certain aspects like this. And so I'm just going to quote them because I can't say it better. <clears throat> Here's the, what the Bible Project is helping us understand in this timeline. So the return from exile under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah didn't solve the people's problems. The decree from Cyrus is incomplete because the authors of the Old Testament were still waiting for a real return from exile and the coming of the messianic kingdom of God. God's people need a deliverer from the deeper kind of exile than simply by being ruled by Babylon. In Chronicles, the literal exile has become an image of Israel's ongoing spiritual exile, their slavery to evil and sin, and their inability to obey the law. This is all representative of the human condition, home and yet not home, until the kingdom of God comes. The chronicler and the people are anxiously awaiting that day. So this story is also revealing, yes, this is true in a physical sense, but it's also true in a spiritual sense. That there are people 
in this story who are not of physical Israel, but who are of spiritual Israel. That though your physical kingdom may be taken away, there is coming a spiritual kingdom that cannot be ripped apart because it's not founded with an earthly king, but a king who is coming, a king who is promised, who will deliver the exiles. And they are missing it at this point, just like we miss it in our own stories. And so this return from exile this permission basically granted for God's people to start returning continues on. It doesn't end in Zerubbabel. And then we get a series of names that ultimately lead us to Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. The task that Matthew undertook 15 verses ago to get us to Jesus that has taken hundreds of years to get to this exact point where God says, I will come. You see, when the Old Testament ends, at this point with the Jews starting to return, there's no more prophets who speak for God. God is silent for hundreds of years. They're left anticipating, waiting. Is God going to be faithful to his promise? This genealogy tells us yes. It puts an exclamation point and says, I have not forgotten you. Let me remind you where you came from. Let me remind you of your unfaithfulness to show my faithfulness to this. The long-expected Messiah is coming. His name is Jesus. He is to be the Christ, the Savior, where he will restore that which is lost. You see, the first advent, as we continue this story, the first advent, his birth into this world, his incarnation, He's restoring the life that was lost in the garden. He is undoing those ripple effects of sin so that we anticipate the second advent. It, what is separating those two is Jesus' life, his death on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, the ransom, undoing that which the antagonist has begun, conquering the foes that we could not conquer even with a suit of armor or a magic hammer. Jesus is the rescuer. He's grounding it in reality, history, proven fact to show that my promises will continue. You can trust me. Look at this story. Now, as God continues this story, we await his second coming, that second advent where with Jesus comes this new heavens and new earth. You see, that story has already been written. Revelation tells us the end of the story. He gives us that sneak peek. We don't know all the details. We just know it's true because he has proven himself through other 65 books of the Bible that it is true. Sin will be done away with. There will be no more death, no more pain, no more COVID, no more election cycles. No more hot Florida sun. We will live with God in perfect shalom in a new garden that's coming where we will eat of the tree of life and live with him forever. But what this story also does is stops us. If this macro story is true, our micro stories are woven in it as well. Do our stories align? Do we, the end point's going to be the same. For those in the kingdom of God, they will enjoy that. For those outside the kingdom, their future is not any, anything that you would want. Complete separation from God. Agony. The final ripple effects. Complete separation, no hope. So this acts as a warning and says, If God has been faithful to this point, he's going to be faithful here. Stop and consider. So maybe you're here today and you're thinking, how does my life intersect here? I think that, remember when I told you to hold on to those names that I pointed out at the beginning, this is where they come back. This story gives us the hope that no matter your background, no matter where you were born, no matter your situation, you too can be a part of God's family. Let me just maybe go back and give you a sampling of some of these people, uh, the types of people that are listed. 
liars, pagans, deceivers. And we're not even out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that point. We also have prostitutes, a victim of sexual abuse, power-hungry leaders, people who lead others in wickedness, bad kings, good kings by world standards, people from families who hate God, the wealthy, the poor, the big wigs of society, the obscure, a carpenter, and a pregnant teenager. This gives me hope. Because if those types of people can be in God's family, so can I. And if those types of people can be in God's family, and I can be in God's family, there's room for you. The way up into this kingdom is a surrender and death to ourselves, the repentance of our sin, acknowledging that we are hopeless. To not numb ourselves with these stories of fiction and seeking to use the Bible as good advice, but as a proclamation of good news. That your helpless state that you're in is a reality, and there will come a day, a reckoning, to where you have to give an account. Jesus has paid that penalty. He is seeking and saving those who are lost. His charge today, my charge today, is to enter into his rest, that shalom. Repent and believe. As we make our way, um, Pastor Pat's going to come up here in just a minute, and he's going to go through the elements of communion, where we look at that sacrifice. So I invite you today to use that time to consider this story, the reality of it, and its inevitable ending and where you are in that story. So I will pray for us, and then we'll continue. Gracious Lord, your scriptures reveal a reality that is grim, that um, shows us in a state of hopelessness. But you, Lord, through your love, has sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins to show that the enemies of sin and death through, the, through Satan, that they are conquered foes, that their time is up, their clock has begun and will ultimately end. So God, I don't know this, the state of everyone's um, soul here today, but Lord, I know that you're faithful to your word and I pray that your spirit um, speaks now to reveal sin and that we leave today a changed people, a people who desires, for, desires their stories to match up with yours. So we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.